Good morning. Welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us at today's distinguished seminar. We are going to get started in just a moment here. Good morning and welcome to everyone who has joined us on both Zoom and YouTube. We will be taking questions from both locations. So if you're here in Zoom, please use the Q&A button that you'll find in your Zoom footer to ask a question. It looks like two, uh, two chat bubbles. If you're joining us on YouTube, please go ahead and just put that in the YouTube chat. So we will get started in just a moment. Please use the chat box at any time during today's presentation to chat with each other, share comments and thoughts, but make sure those questions do end up in the Q&A with the two speech bubbles, or if you are on YouTube, they're all gonna go in the same place. There's not a Q&A button there. There's just one chat box. All right, now I'm going to hand it over to Stephen. So Stephen, please take it away. Hello, everybody. We are very pleased to welcome Gashpar Yikli as the third speaker in this year's Distinguished Seminar Series. This series features presentations by outstanding thinkers and scientists sponsored by the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Distinguished speakers are selected based on the impact of their interdisciplinary research to the neuroscience community. Since 2017, Gashpar has been professor of neuroscience at the University of Exeter in England and a Wellcome Trust senior investigator. For 10 years prior, he was a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen. And prior to that, he did postdoctoral work with Pernell Rorth and Detlev Arendt in Heidelberg. Gaspar earned his PhD in genetics in Budapest and is thus yet another representative of the extraordinarily uncannily strong tradition of Hungarian neuroscience. But that is not the only Hungarian tradition he epitomizes. Gaspar is also a gifted violinist engaged in delightfully propagating the beautiful traditions of Hungarian village music. I'll be putting a link to some of his recordings in the chat. I have found all of Gaspar's work extremely thoughtful and stimulating. Let's let him tell us now about some of his beautiful recent neuroscience. Gaspar. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Stephen, and for the invitation. And uh, I am presenting from Exeter and what you see from Exeter in the UK, what you see in the background is the Exeter Cathedral. And uh, today I would like to speak about our work on uh, sensory systems and uh, motor control and action in uh, a new model organism, uh, the platinaries larva. This is a marine annelid worm. And I would like to start with a general conceptual introduction. And um, this will be important uh, throughout the talk, these concepts, the concept of embodied cognition and reafference. So if you think about a hypothetical animal with some morphology, and with some motor systems and um, effector systems and specialized sensory systems, then uh, as this organism moves and uh, tries to perceive its environment, the, the idea of embodied cognition is that the entire body of the organism and its actions are central to perception and cognition and in creating a shaping reafferent relations. So what are these reafferent relations? So as the animal moves, its actions will inevitably affect its sensory systems. Imagine that you are walking uh, down the street and uh, the scenery is moving because you are moving. So this is the idea of a reafference, the effect of an organism's sensory on, on actions on its sensory mechanism. And then there is, of course, the external inputs, the external cues, exafference. And uh, reafference and exafference are probably equally 
important in in perception and cognition in animals. So I've been uh, greatly influenced in my thinking by this very nice collaboration with philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith and cognitive scientist Fred Kaiser. And you can read more about these ideas and how it relates to the origin of the brain itself in this paper and another paper we published uh, previously. And I would like to understand these interrelationships in the context of entire animal bodies and at the level of individual neurons and synapses. So if we are talking about uh, synaptic resolution information in neuroscience, then obviously this leads to the idea of uh, connectomics and synaptic level connectomics, which I don't need to introduce uh, to, to the Allen Institute. And we have seen a huge uh, progress in this area in the nanometer resolution mapping of brain tissue with serial electromicroscopy, including this very recent petascale data set of the human brain and similar scale data sets from the Allen Institute on the mouse brain. And this is usually impressive and technically both in the imaging side and uh, the computational side, um, usually challenging. And um, my only um, um, problem, and I'm sure that many people share this, uh, this, this view, is that uh, these volumes, uh, if you are talking about uh, large mammalian uh, brains, such as the mouse or humans, only encompass a very large, small fraction of the nervous system itself. So this would be probably the largest possible volume with the current technology uh, relative to the mouse brain. And this is only the brain of the mouse. There is, of course, also there the rest of the body, including the spinal cord and all the muscles and all its other organs. So we have a huge problem of scale. And therefore, to investigate at the synaptic level, this uh, mechanism of reafference um, and embodied cognition are, are really uh, difficult for these large organisms. So this is one of the motivations why we are working on a small organism on these tiny larval stages of platinaries, this marine worm. And these are only a few hundred microns in length, but already have a well-developed nervous system with thousands of neurons and uh, various behaviors. So the advantage of this organism that it has become a powerful laboratory organism in the last decade through the effort of uh, several laboratories. There is a very stable breeding culture. We can have the full life cycle. We can obtain embryos uh, daily, year round. This genome sequence, microinjection, transgenesis, neuron specific promoters, knockouts with, with CRISPR and other um, methods. There is cellular resolution expression mapping in these early stages because the larvae are highly stereotypical. There's the neuronal connectome and imaging is possible because they are highly transparent and pharmacology by mass application. So there are several technical advantages. And uh, <clears throat> this illustrates the, the spawning of these animals, this classic video from uh, Albrecht Fischer, who was one of the early uh, adopters of, of this organism already back in the mid 20th century. So this is a broadcast spawning and the female releases uh, hundreds of eggs, and these are fertilized externally by the male in this nuptial dance. And we can have these spawnings in the laboratory. And a few days later, we have hundreds of completely synchronously developing larvae with almost identical cellular uh, complements. Now, um, one of the first uh, behaviors we investigated and which really um, was the beginning of, of our uh, work on circuit level understanding of behavior is uh, this simple phototactic behavior in the early larvae. <clears throat> larvae are swimming in the dark and then we switch on the directional stimulation and light on one side of this cuvet and all the larvae swim towards the light or pretty much all, all the larvae. So how can this work? So this is the morphology of the early larva. They have a belt of cilia. These are the same cilia that you have in your airways that beat uh, in showing these metachronal waves. So the larva is swimming uh, by cilia and it can sense light by two tiny 
eye spots. These are the simplest eyes in nature, only consisting of two cells, one photoreceptor cell and one pigment cell. And the pigment cell is shading the light sensitive photoreceptor from light. So this gives directionality to the system. So then the question was, okay, what is the connectome of this? How does the, the eye connect to the brain or to the rest of the body? And this was the first serial EM project that uh, we did in collaboration with Harthausen. And the result is very simple. The photoreceptor cell shown here sends a synapse and direct uh, an axon and directly synapses on these locomotor ciliated cells. So it's essentially a two cell uh, connectome from photoreceptor to a motor, an effector cell. It's also called the sensory motor neuron. And then what does the activation of this uh, sensory neuron do to the effector? This we can measure by stimulating the eye and then measuring the activity of the cilia. And what happens if you eliminate the eye, the cilia change beating adjacent to the eye, and this leads to a slowdown of the flow, which can be measured with these beads. So if light hits the eye, the flow slows down on this side. So this is very nice and suggests a simple mechanism of steering. And this reminded us of these conceptual vehicles by, by Valentino Breitenberg in his uh, classic uh, um, book describing this vehicles book, where you have these small uh, carts propelled by these wheels and these sensors which directly connect to the wheels and uh, influence the turning of the wheel. And if there is a directional light source, then this small uh, cart can turn towards the light. Now, thinking about this now, uh, I think this is a misleading analogy because, uh, well, why would the cart move in the first place? No, uh, the, the cart would just be static, wouldn't move. And what would happen if the light would be at the back of the, of the vehicle? Then how would the, how would the vehicle sense where the light is coming from? So to understand how this phototactic steering can, can work, we started to develop a, a mathematical and computational model of the swimming of the larva and the influence of light on, on the cilia. So this shows this schematized larvae where we can calculate the forces generated by the cilia and then the ice will affect the adjacent cilia. And then you can calculate the forces and the, the body position. Now, if you run these simulations, uh, it turns out that um, it's not so easy to get phototaxis. And if you simulate um, a Breitenberg vehicle, this is not going to be phototactic. So what you see here is the, the face space of uh, of uh, these simulations. And this shows here um, the um, angle of the trajectories towards the light in radians. So if it's pi, then we have um, perfect phototaxis. And if we are down here uh, in, this, in this trench, it's red, then there is no phototaxis. So this is where the Breitenberg vehicles sit. They are unable to do phototaxis. And so the question is, why is that? And how can we get phototaxis? Now, of course, then one can think about all kinds of experiments. We could do lots of electrophysiology. We could all do single cell sequencing, find all the genes and knock them out and, and try to understand. But none of these would actually give the answer uh, to how phototaxis works. The, the only approach that could answer this question was really to look at the movement of the entire body and uh, then if you look at the swimming larvae, it turns out that they are actually spinning around their anterior posterior axis. So they are swimming in these helices. And as they swim, they of course also rotate their eyes and the eyes are scanning the environment. And uh, only if you introduce this spinning, which is with, uh, designated with the spin parameter, can be either clockwise or anticlockwise, that doesn't matter, but you need some uh, degree of spinning to allow phototaxis and go up to this plateau of phototaxis. So this shows that um, how the body moves um, is tightly integrated uh, with how the animal 
response and how it can respond. So it, it also shows already in this very simple example, this is probably one of the simplest behaviors and simplest circuits, that the reafference and embodiment are both essential to get any kind of behavior. And we needed this whole body approach to understand how the behavior works. So, and it's also obvious that this phototaxis is not just a simple reflex. The larva is not just responding to light. It has an active form of movement, which is required for the tuning of this movement by light, the modulation of the, of the turning. So this uh, thinking then uh, continued in our later work when I started my lab in um, the Max Planck Institute over 10 years ago. And I really wanted to investigate behaviors in the whole body context and really reconstruct entire circuits and understand how the body and these various types of behaviors are coordinated, such as crawling or the starter response or turning uh, away from the light. And uh, this made it very clear early on that we need to get uh, whole body synapse level information. So we set out to do a whole body uh, serial EM and uh, we, we got initially a great help from Dan Bamberger, who, who is at the Allen Institute now doing much larger volumes and then we, that we can probably ever do. But uh, we managed to obtain a full body this was still conventional transmission electron microscopy data set of this 200 uh, micron larva, uh, approximately 5,000 sections, and reconstructed uh, all the circuits by skeletonization and all the other cells. So this is just an overview of the anatomy. Uh, these three-day-old larvae have uh, a brain and then three trunk segments. These are all the neurons, approximately uh, 2,000 of them only 30k synapses. So this would be a probably ridiculous number for, um, for a human, um, whatever cortical or mouse cortical sample. But uh, for all of the synapses, we know the entire, um, of course, information about uh, which neuron they come from. So these are not only fragments, but fully reconstructed neurons. And then we also have the effector system. So we have, uh, uh, three main types of effectors, the muscles in red, then we have the ciliary bands, and we also have gland cells and pigment cells, so four types of effectors. And all of this in the context of the, of the whole body. And uh, the high resolution electron microscopy allowed us to annotate all the cells in the body, because if you have done EM, then you know how much information is there in these electron microscopic pictures about the fine scale ultrastructure of different types of cells. So now we have a complete reconstruction of this volume with all the neurons. So we identified 182 neuronal cell types based on information about their morphology and connectivity. And this just shows the, the Christmas tree of the neurons. And um, we also identified uh, more than 800 muscle cells, which we could categorize into 53 different types and 37 other types of cells, ciliated cells, gland cells, uh, all kinds of follicular cells, uh, nephridia, and uh, all of this in the context of, of the whole body. So, what uh, can we obtain from such uh, data, of course, this is synaptic resolution, so we can annotate the synapses and, and connect cells to each other. So first of all, we can get the whole body synaptic connectome for this animal, which is um, a connectome of approximately 2000 cells. And this is a um, representation of this connectome where the nodes are the cells and the links are the synaptic connections. You don't see the arrowheads, but it's a directed uh, graph. And we can subdivide it um, uh, by this network analysis into uh, these communities or modules, which roughly correspond to the functional modules that we know exist in the larva, including a neural secretory center. Then we have a special ciliomotor module that I will introduce. Then we have a dedicated module for the control of pigment cells. 
And then we have left-right modules for large exocrine glands, secretory glands in the trunk. Then we have these muscle motor modules in the trunk. We have a postural control system that I will introduce. We have a projection module mostly containing brain interneurons. We have the visual system with the eye and uh, postsynaptic interneurons. And uh, then again, the neurosecretory center. Now, not only the synaptic connectome that we could obtain from the same data set, but also something that we call now the desmosomal connectome. So if you look at a muscle cell, muscles connect and anchor to other cells through these desmosomes, these specialized adhesive structures that are very strong and transmit force. And here is an example of a muscle cell connecting to one of these cells that produces this um, endoskeletal chitin rod, which is called the acicula. And here's another example of a muscle connecting to an epithelial cell. Now, Sanya Jacek in the lab annotated uh, the desmosomes of all 850 muscle cells. And this is shown here. So the cyan dots are the desmosomes and the orange cells are the muscles. And the green cells are the cells that connect to the muscles through the desmosomes and blue cells are motor neurons. And then the red dots are the synapses to the muscles from these motor neurons. So this is how this desmosomal connectome look like. looks like. This is an adhesive network that uh, is formed by muscle cells and all their partners and, and small fragments of the basal lamina, which is also important for adhesion. We can also subdivide it into modules, which roughly correspond to um, the regions of the body, which probably work um, together to, to generate forces and, and, and move the body, including four longitudinal muscle bundles, so two dorsal and two ventral. And then for each appendage, which are also called parapodia, we have um, a cluster of cells. So there are three segments and the left and right uh, appendage in each of the segments. And then we have some other modules in the center, like these oblique muscles that links left and right side of the, of the animal. So I will uh, then start to introduce the various uh, synaptic modules and uh, how they interact with the desmosomal connectome. And I will start with introducing the postural control system. And this is a system of uh, six large motor neurons that are, have their cell bodies in the brain. And they are decussating and projecting down to the trunk, to the tail, to, of the animal, so they span the entire body, and along their uh, lengths, along the axons, they innervate the longitudinal muscles and also the segmental ciliary bands of the larva, and they receive input directly from different types of uh, sensory neurons and also from two main types of interneurons. So, uh, what do these cells do? So we can now map these cells onto the desmosomal connectome. So this is now a combined synaptic desmosomal connectomics. We have here the desmosomal graph and the gray links are desmosomes. And we added these four motor neurons and the synapses are, uh, the synaptic connections are in red. So these four motor neurons form synapses on these longitudinal muscles shown here in the anatomical view. And these muscles then <clears throat> form desmosomes on all these cells and the basal lamina. So what is happening when this motor neuron uh, is active, this will induce the contraction of the muscle and the muscle will pull when it's contracting uh, all, all those other cells that it's adhering to. So this is how then the motor neuron action can lead to the movement of the tissue. And uh, in the case of this um, postural control system, one of the main inputs is the visual system. So these two uh, simple eyes of the larva, this is a different eye than what I showed uh, in the early stage larva. This is already a visual um, system uh, with comparison between left and right side of the body. And uh, um, this 
these eyes uh, mediate the bending of the body. So if you stimulate the eye, you see a contraction on the contralateral side. And this is due to the action of these ventral motor neurons and the contraction of these longitudinal muscles. So this is then the visual circuit. And here is the postural control system, the, the red motor neurons. And then the eyes feed into this through three layers of interneurons. And through this connectomic analysis, we could identify probably functional important motives such as reciprocal connections between left and right side, which we think is there for contrast enhancement or a bilateral divergence here, which we think is a plastic site in the circuit, which enables decisions depending on context, whether to turn towards the light or away from the light because the, the larvae can do both with the same circuit. So uh, in a real life larva, the freely swimming larva, which is not tethered, this uh, leads to this leads to um, behavior. Gaspar, I think something bad happened to the sound. Caitlin? Yeah, seems that we've lost his audio. We'll give him a moment to, looks like yeah. he's trying to reset and get started again. Nope, still can't hear you. I think the trouble started with his cell phone ringing. We can see you. Um, if you're saying something, we can't hear you. Um, let's see, would, you, would it be possible for Goshbar to log out and log back in? Like yes, if you just try clicking the link in the original email again, um, hopefully we can get you back online. Oh, all right, folks, please uh, stand by. Okay, we'll audience, right do you want to hear? Us. Do you want to hear bad jokes while we wait? Oh, looked like he's back. Oh, good, <laughs> because I didn't have any bad jokes. Gashbar, are you there? Yes. Great, we can hear you. Great, sorry about that. Oh, Thanks. it happens. Zoom life. Yes. Oh, We're glad okay. you're back with us. Here's the presentation. So, right. So what I wanted to show here that um, this behavior, even though you could think of it as, a, again, a simple behavior, is quite context dependent. And one example is that it depends on the wavelengths. So this is a wavelength dependent sign switching. If, if the larvae are exposed to UV light, they move away from light. If they are exposed to green light, they move towards the light. So again, we have a circuit that spans the entire body. And uh, this behavior requires active self-initiated movement. So the larva has to move to be able to react, obviously. It's a two pixel visual system with already contrast enhancement and highly context dependent. So the sign of phototaxis depends on uh, the wavelengths of light, but also on temperature and also mechanical inputs can switch the sign of this. So this is also um, not just a simple reflex, but um, a quite sophisticated system. And again, we needed the whole body approach to understand how the system works. So this brings us to the third example, which is about the whole body coordination of cilia. And uh, as you can see here, the larvae are segmented and each segment has this belt of cilia. And these are locomotor cilia. And if you image their activity, they um, show these coordinated arrests of activity. So they stop beating and this happens almost synchronously across the entire body. And then they resume beating, which is also coordinated across the body. You can see in these chymographs. 
So it's presumably a neuron our control, and we want to understand how this works, this coordination. And uh, the key insight came from this calcium imaging experiments, which uh, uh, showed that there are rhythmically active neurons, such as this one in the middle of the head, which show um, activity which is perfectly correlated with the calcium signals in the ciliate cell. And we know that these calcium signals are shutting off the cilia. So these neurons correlate with the closures, which suggests that actually this neuronal activity may be the driver of these closures. And uh, if we reconstruct the same cell uh, from the electron microscopy, we see this cell in the, in the head, which we call the MC cell, which has two axons that run along the ciliary band and form the synapses all along the ciliate cell. So this is the connectome of the single neuron, which is a cholinergic motor neuron innervating all the head ciliary band cells. And uh, so is this required for the closures? So we can look at the activity of the cell and the activity of the cilia, and we can kill this cell with the pulsed UV laser during the experiment and continue the imaging. The, and then we see that the ciliate cells don't show these regular closures anymore. So it seems indeed that this single ciliomotor neuron is important for these regular closures of the ciliary band. And, uh, but this coordination extends to the entire body across the segments. And we found two equivalent cholinergic neurons, which are, we call the loop neurons in the trunk of the larva that span the entire body and innervate all the segmentally arranged ciliary bands. So red speckles are the synapses on the ciliated cells. And these also show completely synchronous activity with the MC cell in the brain and with the cilia. Now, these uh, cholinergic neurons are antagonized by equally gigantic whole body serotonergic neurons, which uh, one is shown here in EM reconstruction. So it also spans the entire larva, all the segments of the trunk, and also goes up to the brain. And the same cell is labeled here uh, with transgenesis, just to show you that uh, we can have single neuron access in this organism now, and uh, we can manipulate individual uh, genetically identifiable and connectomically identifiable neurons. So we know exactly that it's the same neuron. Yeah. And um, so when these neurons are active, this correlates with the, with the beating phases of the cilia. So these two systems, the cholinergic and the serotonergic, show this very nice antagonistic relationship and uh, the cholinergic is responsible for stopping the cilia and the serotonergic for res resumption of beating and keeping the cilia beating. So this is in the context of the, of the whole connectome, the ciliomotor module. This is the summary diagram. And this whole system is driven by a catecholaminergic pacemaker of, of three neurons, which have dopamine and noradrenaline. And these drive these uh, alternating rhythms. And by extending to the whole body, these neurons then coordinate the cilia. And what is, what is this good for? This, we think, is a system for buoyancy regulation. So the larvae are planktonic and are kind of hovering and swimming in the open water. And in these vertical columns, you can see how the larvae is swimming up and then sinking down. And, um, this is uh, due to this alternating activation of the ciliary bands. So then you may ask, is there any reafference here? We think there's also a reafferent connection here because as the larva swims, it generates these flow fields. This is a tethered larva and we, we see with these micro beads, the shape of these flow fields. And uh, there is an interesting point in the larva at the very tip of the head, which is the physicists call the stagnation point, where there is very little flow. And exactly there where this stagnation point is, there are two dedicated flow sensory neurons, this MS neurons, which uh, feed into the ciliomotor system. So we think that uh, somehow the larva also knows when it is swimming through these uh, reafferent uh, 
flow sensory system and tunes the activity of the of the cilia as a function of uh, maybe flow conditions. So again, we have a circuit that spans the entire body. We could only understand this by looking at the entire body at synaptic resolution. The brain itself would not have been enough to understand this coordination. And it's driven by an autonomous pacemaker. It's influenced by uh, flow and self-initiated movement. So it has reafferent uh, um, inputs or feedback. And we also know that it's massively modulated by neuropeptides. So it's again, uh, far from a simple circuit or simple reflex. Now, the last example is the startle response of the larvae, which we can trigger just by banging on the microscope stage and you see the larvae are swimming and then they are frightened and throw up their small uh, appendages, which have these bristles or the chitae and stop, completely stop swimming. So they shut off the cilia and then lift the, the legs. And we can study this in this tethered larvae. Again, we have the flow, the marker, the beads, and there's this probe, this tungsten probe, which is moved by a piezo motor to trigger these uh, vibrations. And from it, this, it's very clear that it's a hydrodynamic response. So you don't need to touch the larva, it's just through the water borne vibrations. And uh, if you do a small stimulation, then the flow stops. And if uh, we do a stronger simulation, then the flow stops and the animal lifts its uh, parapodia. So it's a scalable um, behavior, depending on stimulus intensity, we, we get uh, um, different responses. And uh, this hydrodynamic startle response is mediated by hydrodynamic mechanosensory neurons, which have these uh, primary cilia, these sensory cilia, which uh, are surrounded by 10 microvilli and they have these tip links. So this is very similar to hair cells of vertebrates, also molecularly. And uh, they are some in the head and also some in the tail of the larva. And these are the flow sensory MS cells. Now, how do we know that this is this so-called CR or collar receptor neurons because they have this nice collar uh, responsible for this uh, hydrodynamic uh, sensation. We know it from uh, both uh, physiological and, and genetic evidence. So this is an experiment of a calcium imaging of a tethered larva. You see these two antennae. These are two cilia of these collar receptors. And then it's stimulated by the tungsten probe. And then we can measure the activity from these uh, CR neurons and they respond to this vibration. Whereas these MS cells, they don't respond to these vibrations. These respond to flow. So then again, what is the connectome? So we can find the CR neurons in the EM data because of their very characteristic sensory morphology. They are here in the head and some in the tail. And uh, then now as shown in red, they synapse on various interneurons. This is one of the major ones. It's a descending interneuron with a soma in the head that again runs, runs along the entire length of, of, the, of the trunk. And they are these segmental pseudo unipolar interneurons that also receive direct input from the collar receptors. And then those synapses, those interneurons on uh, various muscle motor and ciliomotor neurons, which then uh, influence the startle muscles and the ciliary band. So, Again, we have the whole body connectome from head and tail, and there is differential innervation from head and tail, and also the behavior is different for major classes of interneurons and the ciliomotor module with the ciliomotor neurons, the loop and the MC and another type, which innervates the cilia and is responsible for shutting off the cilia. And then this muscle motor module going through um, several classes of motor neurons in the trunk. And uh, it shows extensive um, also intersegmental coordination, the circuit. So we have the sensory cells in the head and the tail, which is called pygidium. And these reach up or down several segments, innervate the, these interneurons, 
which then further reach across segments to these motor neurons, which then can reach across segments. So they are motor neurons which innervate two muscles in two different segments. So this ensures um, an intersegmental coordination. So even if we just stimulate the head, you can actually get contractions also in the last uh, segment, the third segment of the trunk. Now I have a, um, a link here, and uh, if you, you could type this in, or I just tweeted now, you can go to my Twitter, Ekeli Lab. If you have a lab, I mean, uh, obviously you will have a computer in front of you, uh, then um, you can just look for my latest tweet. And if you click on this link, this should open up a, a cat made, uh, window and load the neurons and the muscles of the startle circuit so you can more interactively investigate this. This is a great new feature now of CatMade, which I have to mention powered the entire reconstruction and part of the analysis of these data. And uh, then you can play with it. You can then put them in the different widgets to analyze connectivity, analyze uh, morphologies, whatever you please. And you can investigate this now in the context of the entire um, connectome and desmosomal connectome. So everything is there in this CatMate uh, site. So just to finish uh, this part, uh, again, you could ask, is this start of behavior just a simple reflex uh, that who cares? No, it's not some higher cognitive function. Well, <clears throat> Maybe, but there's, there's many arguments against that, it's such a simplistic interpretation. So um, I showed that behavior is scalable. So this just shows uh, examples of, of the scalability. This is filament speed and uh, the behavioral output. You see that there's this bimodal distribution. There are some that weakly startle, others that strongly startle. And there's a difference between head stimulation and tail stimulation, so there's directional sensitivity. There's a global coordination in this response. There's a persistence, so once you startle them, they remain startled for several seconds. There's a hierarchy with other behaviors. It's also highly uh, context dependent. There is proprioceptive feedback circuit, which, which I, I didn't show. So essentially, as the larvae lifts its legs, it has sensory cells, proprioceptors in the legs, so it will know that it actually lifted its leg. It's actually, again, a reafferent uh, mechanism. And there's habituation, there's huge change in development and maybe a circadian change. And many of these neurons are full of neuropeptides. So probably, again, very strongly modulated. So um, then <clears throat> let's try to put this again into a, um, full body and, and real life context. And uh, this example uh, I show you illustrates that. So we know from um, mapping the gene expression of, and finding the mechanosensory markers that these collar receptor neurons are specifically expressing um, heterodimeric polycystine channel of uh, two PKD genes, which Louis Bezares, who did this study, knocked out by CRISPR. And what you see here is a homozygous mutant for one of these polycystins. You can vibrate these, these larvae as much as you want. They will not startle at all. So these are completely deaf to this stimulation. And uh, this allowed to test the natural function of the startle behavior, which is always considered to be some kind of uh, uh, avoidance of, of predation. So we expose the larvae to this giant copepod predator, this beautiful uh, Centropagus, which is a hydrodynamic predator. It has these giant antennae, and it's actually following the hydrodynamic trail of various zooplankton. So it's not uh, following by, uh, not hunting by vision, but by mechanical sensation. And here it comes. Here's a platinarius larva, a wild type, and you see the startle and the this copper pot spits out the larva. And then we, we feed it with the, with the PKD mutant. This is now the other uh, subunit. This one is eaten by, the, by this copper pot. So it seems that startling, the ability to startle is indeed important um, to respond to, to predator. This is quantified here. 
cis predation rate in wild type and homozygous mutant animals, and you see the, the big difference. So it's a good idea for a planktonic larva to have um, hydrodynamic sense and uh, the ability to, to start on. Now, again, um, that it's not a simple reflex, but you need to imagine here that there is a larva that when it swims, it generates these hydrodynamic signatures, it generates flows, it can't do otherwise. No, it's uh, uh, as it moves by cilia, there will be these flow fields. And there's this gigantic predator that actually senses these flow fields and tries to eat this other guy. So, but this what other guy invented is the ability to sense the approaching predator. So if there is a disturbance in the flow field in the water, so these are water mediated signals, then it will stop the cilia first to actually stop. It's a, like a camouflage, not to stop telling its location because when the cilia stop, also these flows stop. So it's a very interesting interaction between predator and prey at, at the micro scale. And at least in this organism, we have, have now a handle on the circuits and the genetics of this behavior. So to close off, and um, this is uh, just a few more general ideas. The question is, are, are these worms simple? Are these circuits simple? Well, to that, for that, I would just like to show you the bobbit worm, this gigantic two meter annelid that uh, divorced this very stupid animal. I think it was some kind of vertebrate or what. Uh, so it's obviously a higher animal than, than this fish because it eats it. So just think about, uh, think about the worms like this. And I'm not talking about nematode worms. So thou shalt not underestimate the worm. This is uh, lesson number one. Now, there are a couple of um, take home messages. So. I think that it's very important to look at whole body, whole bodies to understand uh, motor control. And I think we cannot understand the brain without understanding the body and reference because of this very tight uh, feedback of action to, to sensing. And I think that small animals that are smaller than a cubic millimeter have great potential for connectomics, uh, whole brain imaging and so on. And I think we need alternative model systems where we have genetic access and laboratory culture to enrich uh, neuroscience. And because comparative biology is a very powerful approach to reveal general principles, just think about comparative genomics. What would we do if we only had a mouse genome and the human genome and the Drosophila genome? We would know nothing about how genomes evolve and what's the diversity of, of genomes. So, and uh, finally, small is not simple. And uh, one, uh, two more closing slides. So this is a, a very funny tweet of a Tesla, of course, machine intelligence. So the, what I said has also relevance for AI. It thinks that uh, there is an infinite uh, uh, continuation of these traffic lights coming in, in the road because there is a truck that is transporting traffic lights. So this Tesla has no way of understanding what's going on. And it's probably because um, a lot of the training of these AI uh, algorithms is happening with these static 2D images. And this is not, not a good way to learn about the nature of reality. So I would suggest Elon Musk to read The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception uh, by James Gibson, which uh, discusses exactly the importance of movement and reference for, for visual perception. And finally, I think that uh, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, we have this idea of this mother brain, this, this highly intelligent super brain uh, soaked in, in a solution. And there may be some virus coming out of this. I think this is a, a very naive view and without a real body, it will be very hard to, to have develop or to understand real life intelligence. So I would like to stop here and thank the members of my group and our funders. And I'm happy to take questions. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, Gaspar, for a really wonderful and super stimulating talk. Um, so I guess now we need to figure out a way to serial section 
the whole mouse and then on to the human. Um, uh, you've, you've laid a pretty big challenge in front of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, that was wonderful. We have one question so far from the audience, so I will pass it on. This is from an anonymous attendee. Here's the question. How many photoreceptor cells and cilia cells does a platy larva have? Is the receptor cilia connection one to one or one to n? Yes, yeah, so in the early larva, there are two photoreceptor cells in the early eye spot, one left, one right. In the late larva with this visual system, they have five to eight photoreceptors in the cell. And in the early larva, the connection is uh, one photoreceptor synapses on two or three ciliated cells. They are overall 80 ciliated, multiciliated cells in the three-day-old larva, 23 of them in this head ring. And just a few of them are innervated by these early eyes. And the late eyes, those don't innervate the, the cilia. Those go to interneurons and to the brain. So it's a very different system. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, while you were answering that question, another one came in. This is from Hankui Zhang. Fascinating talk. How did you classify cell types from the connectome? What features, parameters did you use? Thank you. Uh, this uh, was um, based on several criteria. So one is morphology, so the shape of the, the projections of the neuron, the position of, of the soma, then the synaptic uh, connectivity, for example, if it's a sensory neuron um, or a motor neuron, it has to connect some kind of effector. For the sensory cells, we have additional information about sensory specializations. So I showed these uh, mechanosensory cells highly highly special uh, specialized cilia, which was the main criterion for uh, classifying them. So these were the main parameters. We, we tried to do um, approaches like uh, Scholl analysis or NBLAST, but these uh, just give uh, quite crude uh, classification. So we had to do this um, manually, essentially. Okay, well, I have uh, a question area of my own I'd like to open up. Um, you have commented a couple times on plasticity of some of these um, complex reactions. Um, uh, habituation is you know, generally considered one of the simpler forms of plasticity, but a lot has been learned by studying that. Um, how, what do you think the prospects for studying other forms, for instance, associative forms of plasticity, associative learning, and so on with this particular uh, larva? I think one uh, needs to go to later stages, to six-day-old stages, which are slightly larger, uh, because um, a study from Detle Varen's laboratory showed that uh, the mushroom bodies, which we, we think are the associative brain structures, develop uh, only later. So in this connectome, the mushroom bodies are not yet there. And this is just morphological um, indication that there is associative learning. No one has shown for an analyte properly associative learning. So one would need to establish training paradigms. And I know also for zebrafish, this is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't know at the moment how to teach them. But then uh, once we have that, I think that one can approach that with imaging, connectomics, genetics. Yeah. C can I assume that you have tried some associative protocols at, at this larval stage? You know, for instance, flashing a light and then pairing it with the hydrodynamic stimulus and seeing if you can get startle from the light alone. I mean, that would be one possibility that comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, not yet extensively, but uh, it's definitely something that sh should be on the agenda. Yes. Okay, yet another comment and question has come in. This is from Joanne Buchanan. Beautiful work and presentation. Um, do these larvae have glial cells? Yes, they indeed have uh, many glial cells and uh, those are 
also annotated and those can be recognized by their, of course, this, their sheet like glia and this radial type like glia uh, can be recognized by the outer structural features. We, we know that molecularly they are similar to, for example, the fly glia, so they express some of the markers like repo or glia cells missing. We don't know much about their function at all. Uh, okay, the questions are starting to pour in now. Caitlin, is there a way that we could let the, and they're getting more complicated, um, is there a way that we could let the questioners um, ask their questions or should I just read them? You can go ahead and read them from the Q&A on their behalf. Okay. Um, sorry, Casey and Han Kui again. Um, here goes. Um, from Casey schneider Mizell. In the fly, you have everything from fully separate dendrites and axons to completely intermingled local interneurons. Mammalian cortex has neurons that are fully segregated, but some parts of the brain, e.g. thalamus or spinal cord, have neurons with intermingled synapses as well. How diverse are plat platinerous nereus Platinerous neurons in terms of the synaptic input output segregation on neural arbors. Have you noticed any principles underlying this throughout the body wide connectome? Yes, that's a very interesting question. We indeed looked at that, and uh, most of the neurons have, so there are no dendrites and axons, the separate uh, arbors in, in these neurons. These are more all. Uh, have a single neurite, which has some specializations based on the input output. So many neurons have inputs closer to the so soma and outputs further away from the, from the soma. And this we have quantified for sensory, inter and motor neurons globally. And we all see this uh, general pattern, but there are also some neurons that are, have intermingled input outputs throughout their, their neurites. So we find those types, but no vertebrate type dendrites. All the dendrites that exist are sensory dendrites. So only the, the sensory cells are bipolar. Yeah, great. Okay, next we have another question from Hong Kui. Um, and let's see, they're coming in so fast, they're scrolling out of my... Uh, uh, can you model one of the behaviors, e.g. the startle response behavior? What information do you need in order to build that model? Yeah, we did some toy models of the, for example, the visual behavior about this contrast, this uh, uh, enhancement that can, can be modeled with relatively few assumptions. The startle behavior has a very um, complicated motor component with uh, 250 different muscles. Um, so that would require some kind of, if you want to model the, the whole body behavior, some kind of uh, elastic models of muscles and uh, how they link together and then what is the neuronal input. I, um, I think the, the system is, is certainly uh, almost, almost there for that. The first circuit we would like to model is the, the pacemaker of the cilia. So we collaborate with mathematicians in the Living Systems Institute. Thank you. Got some more. Um, Boas Levy uh, wants to know what you think is going on with the approximately 10% of larvae that do not move to the light. Yeah, um, of course, uh, variability in behavior is, is a very interesting question. I don't think there's any genetic uh, difference, although could be that uh, you know, these are some segregating mutations in, in the culture. It's more likely to be due to some kind of just physical adherence to the plastic. So different dishes have different uh, properties in terms of how much, how sticky they are. So could be that for some larvae are misdeveloped, there can be like polyspermy. It is externally fertilized. And if you have too much sperm, then there will be many misdeveloping larvae possibly due to polyspermy, can be many reasons, but. Yeah. So you may have a model of human neurodevelopmental disorders there. <laughs> uh, let's see, Claire Gamlin wants to know, oh, well, first she has a comment. Thank you for a very interesting talk. And then she wants to know, 
Do you have a sense of the variability in connectivity number of synapses from cells of a single type? We, we have some sense and it's quite uh, stereotypic. We also did the um, eye circuit of a, of a second larva and uh, the numbers are, are broadly consistent and the connectivity is very similar. I should say that there are still in this data set, this is a very old data set now, um, there are some technical issues. So we couldn't 100% uh, assign all the synapses to, to the neurons. So we have um, five to 10% um, just fragments, which, which we cannot link up. So exact quantification would be maybe error prone in this data set. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and answer. Forrest Coleman wonders if you had any comments or anecdotes about how your anatomical data has influenced other labs studying this system with purely physiological or genetic approaches. Well, at the moment there are maybe 10, 15 labs. So it's a slowly growing community, but there are of course many many uh, interests in development and other things. Uh, larval circuits, um, I don't think any other lab is, is doing at the moment, but uh, there's a lot to be done and I'm very happy to share capturing protocols. And I think I want to encourage people to build on the system and move away from conventional systems which are overrepresented. Yeah. Okay, well, our, our Time is up. You have done a beautiful job of staying, keeping us on schedule in spite of some technology issues that were beyond your control. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, for the rest of the audience, um, uh, there is the possibility that if you emailed Amy Kim, uh, let's see, what I'm trying to say here is Gashpar will be meeting via Zoom with some small groups over, I believe, the next couple of days. There are you know, a small number of slots. Um, I'm not sure if there's any space left in that schedule, but if you were, if you really wanted to talk to Gashpar some more, had more questions, um, you could email Amy Kim. And all of you Institute people have that email. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and for a, a nice batch of questions, but especially I want to thank Gashbar for an extremely wonderful uh, and stimulating talk. I in, enjoyed this um, on a par with how much I enjoyed your violin group's music, which is a lot. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody. And thank you everyone for joining us today. The talk recording will be available on YouTube. So please see the Allen Institute website soon for that. And our next distinguished seminar is on July 22nd. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Gashbar. Thank you, bye.